him, but but no one with him. But he wait. are early on the scene for the German Grand Prix of 1967. Good to see that John Surtees can still ride a bike. BRM bring four H16 cylinder cars. Jackie Stewart's is a lighter, slimmer model with strengthened front suspension. A wise precaution at Nürburgring. Raymond Mays is there to cast a paternal eye over the preparations as Stewart arrives. Tony Rudd hopes his brain children won't let him down as Cooper come in. Roy Salvadori keeps an eye on things, and as the latest models are unveiled to the public gaze, the maestro himself, John Cooper. He brings a new low-line 36-valve job for Rint, Rodriguez's 1966 car, and a spare. The world's motoring press is here in full strength. Here's John Bolster with Gregor Grant of Autosport and Dennis Jenkinson from Motorsport. Rob Walker has a Cooper for Joe Siffert. As always, Lotus are a centre of attraction. For Graham Hill, a new chassis on the car that practice crashed at Silverstone. For Clark, the car he has driven since Zandvoort, and a spare. There's a choice too for Chris Amon, which includes a brand new lighter model with altered gearbox. Then Dan Gurney's Anglo-American team appears with two 12-cylinder Westlake powered Eagles. Their fuel injection systems modified again. The Eagle's talony beak has to be removed for ground clearance down the ramp. Harry Westlake, it's reported, has improved the airflow through the radiators on both cars, one of which has a spanking new engine. The Repco Brabants, the reigning world champion who was also top ringmaster of 1966, and Denny Halm, will drive the cars they raced at Le Mans and Silverstone. Joe Bonnier's Cooper Maserati arrives, well shrouded, but it doesn't take long to display its Swiss red body. Joe won here in 1960 on Porsche. As usual, the industrial lager, the trade paddock, is busy with everybody pushing out refreshments. And now the paddock proper is full of vans and activity as De Tag approaches. But what lies ahead for cars and drivers? From the start, a short straight to the south curb, where a 180 degree turn brings the cars back behind the pits. Then two left-handers in quick succession and down through Hatzenbach to the two kilometer long racing stretch through Flugplatz, then to Schwedenkreuz and on to Aremberg. A fierce right-hander thought to be the worst hazard of all. See what the driver sees as Hubert Hanna in the BMW powered Lola takes the bend. Under the bridge and into another fast stretch, Fuchsröhre to Adnarforst, where a left, a right and a left follow in quick succession. Line is all important here. Watch Hanna's. Whoops, not out of the book. Then more twists and turns to Kallenhard and Versiefen, and on to Exmula at kilometre 10, where the climb really begins. Hanna, in spite of his two-litre engine, is entered in the three-litre event. At Nürburgring, it isn't always the most powerful car which stands the best chance. This section needs heavy braking and quick acceleration. Watch the anchors go on. Down the dip, 
over the bridge and up again. It's hairy, all right. A fastest section to the right-hander at Berwick, nearly halfway round. Then about two kilometres of bumpy, fast road to the two right-handers leading up to the carousel. Here, Hana takes the last right before the sharply banked hairpin. It's as bumpy as hell. Watch the front suspension working on the camera car. Notice how Hana comes out at the very tip of the white concrete banking. So to the highest point of the course, Hoa Acht, through Wippermann and Esbach to the long sweep down to Brunchen and up again at the exit from the bend. Here's Hana on the way down. One of the hardest things about Nürburgring is the constantly changing light as the course twists and turns in and out of the high trees. The driver's eyes get a constant battery. On through Flansgarten to kilometre 18 and the beginning of Schwalbenschwanz, the swallow's tail. Uphill with a right, left over a bridge with a bump and round the Kleiner carousel, another bank's corner. The right, the bridge, the left and the bump. Round the little carousel and away up through the trees towards the strait. For the drivers, one lap of torture is nearly over. The strait, three kilometers of it, is real racing ground. Watch Hana go. Just before the pits, a chicane has been built this year to slow the cars into the pit straight. This is what it looks like from the driver's viewpoint. Well, that's Nürburgring. 22.8 kilometers, 174 bends. Why is the ring such a tough circuit? Well, it is um, 14 miles of uh, really concentrated, hard motoring for not only the driver, but for the car. Uh, from the driver's point of view, I think it's the, probably the biggest test of any circuit going. The problem is, is the terrific length of the circuit, and a lot of the corners are very much the same, and you don't know quite really which one you're at or how quick you can go. And it would take me at least another two meetings, I think, before I get used to it, unless, of course, I finish this Grand Prix, then by that time I should know a bit more about it. One of the problems not to do very well. Uh, it's the right kind of car for this circuit, I think. But uh, who knows, really. What sort of problems does this circuit present for a new car? Getting the right gearing is important, and trying to make the best compromise, getting over the real rough stuff, and getting through the, the uh, rough bottoming where you're apt to touch bottom. All of these things uh, are important. One never really goes around there, I don't think, to the limit of the motor car. Um, you're uh, going around jumping from one bump to another, really, and just making what you can of it. How much experience do you need to learn this circuit? Well, I was talking to Benjo yesterday, and uh, he probably knows as much about this place as anybody. He said every lap he ever did in his life here, he learned a little bit more. Bueno, yo considero que el circuito de nuevo reino. I think that the Nürburgring is one of the best circuits for a driver. The output of the car is not the most important thing. It is a question of knowing how to use the power that you have. Nunca se sabe cuál es el último tiempo que se puede echar. What does it take to win the race here? Um, well, actually, this is one race that requires a lot of skill, um, a very good motor car, and a lot of luck. <laughs> Unless you've got the combination of all three. I find it's impossible to win here. It requires quite a, quite a lot to learn the circuit initially, and then of course you've got to learn to go racing around it, which is something quite different. The cars get a hell of a bashing and crashing, they take off the ground, they come, they, they're subjected to much greater strains than they are normally on any normal racing circuit, and of course so is the driver. The three training periods stretch over two days, and the ringmasters prepare for battle. Bonnier chats with Brint, and Eamon dresses for the show. Mike Spence, all smiles as usual, makes sure that the footwear is right. Kana and the BMW. Joe Sippert. John Surtees, winner in 63 and 64, is having bottoming troubles. And he isn't the only one. 
by a long chalk. Colin Chapman thinks there's a mouse inside. Who's that down there? Breaks trouble the lotus to keep. A Formula 2 Matra will be faster in practice than all but two of the Formula 1 cars. The man who will do it is Jackie Ix. Practice brings its drama. Listen to Graham Hill. Well, I crashed. Yeah, I arrived on a rather fast downhill section and uh, somehow or other I wasn't uh, retarding as much as I'd hoped to be and uh, I went up the bank and it knocked all the wheels off. Jack Brabham had a moment too. We asked him afterwards what happened. We modified the uh, rear suspension and had some special bolts made in England to try and give us a bit more clearance off the tyres. And this bolt just broke like a carrot and let the rear wheel come off. The uh, tyre blew out when it swung round and the moment the uh, tyre was punctured this allowed the chassis to get down on the ground. I was able to keep the car or get it back on the road and straighten it up with just the chassis rubbing on the road and the tyre being flat was only dragging and not trying to pull the car around. <laughs> Both cars get repaired through the midnight hours. I cut engine at maximum, but engine fills sometimes on one turn, they're not so healthy. We haven't even got all the fuel in yet. I got pulled in on these 370s for a lap or two. Which 370s? Oversteers. No, it was okay, but when you put the gas on, the car goes Listen, I haven't had any brakes yet. Thunder Lord, and you feel it in every gear. You can feel it through the clutch. I stood on as hard as I could, and it just all crashed again to a stop. Wouldn't it hurt, but you're not going to stop it. No, because it's just coming, it must be just coming down on the aisle. He's up here somewhere. Let me see him to Mike. Yes, he's just touring back in. Well, that's the next pair, I've got to get the car running first. It handles like a beer, but yeah, it's a bit slow, yeah. Yeah, I know, well, no. I'll fix you on the day. Great. For a consideration. Consideration. Race day dawns in the smoke of campfires and frying sausages. The Germans take their motorsport with seriousness, but not with passing. Many have been camping out for several days. Their colourful tents and sunshades make the Grand Prix a gala occasion. But don't run away with the idea that it's only the motors which matter. Quick workers, the Germans. But it isn't so quick driving to the circuit on race day. Inside, there's plenty to do and see while you wait for the start. It may not have struck you before that there are more ways than one of eating a German sausage. Yes, it's all a question of arriving early to enjoy the fun. And there's certainly plenty of that. But in the end, all ways lead into the arena, where the ringmasters will perform. Before the big race, the crowd are entertained by a bunch of presumably sane people doing ridiculous things with motor cars. And then the whip cracks and the ringmasters enter. Eamon on Ferrari. Stewart, PRN. Joe Bonnier with his own Cooper Maserati. McLaren Eagle, followed by Rodriguez, Cooper and the Honda. And it's with the new the Drivers can now warm the cars up on the short length round by the south curve and back through the gate to the top of the tunnel.
There's Joachim Rint and the 36-valve Cooper Maserati. Jim Clark waits to occupy his customary pole position. Mike Spence in the second BRM. Graham hopes against hope that his bad luck is over at last. He's had more than his share this season. Colin Chapman, too, is obviously hoping just as hard. There's Dan Gurney. Excitement rises to a crescendo as the time nears for the cars to be moved to the dummy grid. To keep the long circuit full and the customers happy, a Formula 2 event is being run concurrently, but the smaller cars are not eligible for the major prize. 17 Formula 1s and 8 Formula 2s make up the grid, the 2-litre cars behind. 15 laps, 342.15 kilometres of the toughest Grand Prix circuit in the world lie ahead. The president of the Automobile Club von Deutschland briefs the drivers. now. Stewart is ahead of Surtees and Eamon, eighth, waits his opportunity. Through the pits again and the first three are widening the gap, but Halm and Gurney are reducing the Lotus lead. Eamon, seventh, is now ahead of Surtees. Hill, in spite of his troubles, has passed Ligier and is second from the tail. That's a Formula 2 car behind. First into the pits is Joe Sippert in Rob Walker's Cooper. A second or so later, Chris Irwin comes in. The Parnell H16 BRM has a common or garden puncture. But poor Sippert has burst a hose with an obvious loss of coolant. Irwin's away in two minutes, but it takes 15 to clear up Sippert's mess. Over the bump, which puts the plug in plug plots, come the leaders. They must love each other dearly to stay that close. McLaren is now past Brabham, and they're dicing it out for fourth place. Stewart is sixth. Eamon seventh. Surtees eighth. <laughs> Now Hill is ahead of Bonnier, and with Irwin and Sippert having pit stopped, is up to 13th place. Lap four. Halm and Gurney are right up with Clark now. Jim seems far from happy, but is motoring fast enough to hold him off. The Honda Fine when it's dull, overheats and loses power when the sun comes out. A bit hard on a car from the land of the rising sun. At the end of the third tour, Spence comes in with transmission trouble. Still incarcerated, Siffert offers condolences. It's no good looking at it, mate. It just won't work. A shattered crown and pinion causes the first retirement of the race. Up and over at Flugplatz. And Holm has the lead from Clark. What's wrong with Jim, the crowd asks.
at Adenauer Forst, Gurney is through as well, and Clark is nowhere to be seen. Brabham is third. Stewart, fourth. At Brunchen, Gurney has taken home, and the eagle's beak is pecking at no one's exhaust. And Clark, limping home, is passed by Rint, now lying eighth. Rodriguez is ninth in the other works Cooper. Hill is now the lone hope of Lotus. McLaren on the other eagle also goes out on the fourth. Quite a lap. Gurney three seconds up as the fifth begins, having broken Jim Clark's lap record with 8.21.8 on lap three. Incredibly, Jackie Ickes in the Formula 2 matra has passed Eamon and Surtees to take fifth overall. Rint is eighth, but not for long. Watch him fight the car. He's in steering trouble. At the end of the back straight, he retires. And Clark is in for keeps. The Lotus was getting harder to handle all the time. A slow puncture the cause, and now, as a result, a suspension rocker arm is bent. <laughs> With Clark goes Colin Chapman's brightest hope. The two Jacks, Brabham and Stewart, are still nose to tail, but the impudent, some think imprudent, X is coming up at a rate of knots. Lap six. The first two are in the same order. Gurney has broken the lap record again with 8.18.2 and pulled up another five seconds. Stewart has got ahead of Brabham and is now third. But not for long. Soon he's out with a broken crown wheel way out in the country. Parnut, BMW, is 10th. Hill has moved to 11th. And there's Rince Cooper, out for the duration. But still it's Gurney, Gurney all the way. This is the fastest lap, 815.1, over 103 miles an hour. The Brabans can't keep up. Hicks and Eamon. The bumps and bangs are tearing at the cars. Suspension breakdowns are frequent, and who could wonder at it? Graham's in trouble and motoring slowly with a wobbly wheel. Rodriguez has a bottom wishbone ball joint shattered. Hill's trouble is quickly diagnosed, a loose front wheel. The things that can happen in motor racing. It's soon fixed. Lotus are still in the race. Rodriguez takes some 15 minutes of rush work to get him motoring, but that's better than poor Rint. John Cooper's hopes of an outright win have faded, but he's never the man to admit it. After all, anything can happen in this game. McLaren has walked in to join the pitside fusiliers. Gurney's record lap has put him 15 seconds up on Denny Hound. Jack Brabham has the impudent X right up his exhaust pipes at this stage, and behind them, the lone Ferrari is catching up fast. Lap seven, and no change in the race order. Graham is still soldiering on, but without hope or confidence. As lap eight begins, Gurney is 22 seconds up. Eamon has passed X and is pushing Brabham hard. It's wheel tip to wheel tip along the straight, but the Ferrari hasn't quite got the steam to make it. A long way behind, Surtees, 
fifth now among the big bangers, sixth overall. For Jackie Stewart, the long walk home is over, but life has its compensations. Oh, they just dragged me the whole way, both sides. But I, I took about two, well, laugh and three quarters to get past 50. Yeah. You know, it goes well downhill, though, doesn't it? Yeah, but you know, it's one side, the other side of a wave of blue flag. 29 seconds up now, Gurney roars past to start lap nine. Still, the Brabham and the Ferrari are tied together with string. Joe Bonnier is enjoying a private battle with a Formula 2 job. But for Hill and Lotus, the race is run. A suspension bolt had come adrift and done the works no good at all. So ends his unhappy day. I've had a whole season of incidents packed into just one Grand Prix, he's reported as saying. Anyway, the Lotus is only good for the dead car park and it's no good making excuses. You know you broke it. Lap 10 begins. Chris Irwin is in with a broken clutch. Putting fuel in against the rules costs Tim Parnell 200 Deutschmarks fine. But by cannibalizing Spence's car, they get Irwin back into the race with only one lap lost. Tana has had a long walk back when his suspension collapsed out in the country. When this sort of thing happens, the life of a team manager seems hard. But the driver always finds something to fill in the time. Ix's gallant drive ends with a front suspension bracket offered as a sacrifice to the gods of Nürburgring. Dan Gurney, now 45 seconds ahead, seems unassailable. But this 13th lap, only two to go, is to be his unlucky one. His gallant drive ends as the Eagle's drive shaft breaks. And at Schwalbenschwanz, it's Halm who comes through first. 46 seconds ahead of his teammate and Eamon, still dicing together. The Honda, in fourth place, is 73 seconds behind. More trouble for Sippert, Fuel again. Sippert arrives back and the petrol pump fault is diagnosed. It doesn't take long to fix. Irwin is back in the race by courtesy of the Spence Spare Part Agency. He's two laps down. So is Pedro Rodriguez, who's ninth. Joe Bonnier is sixth. Ligier is seventh, two laps adrift. Brown starts the last lap. Brabham and Eamon 43 seconds behind. So it's Repco Brabham in first and second places, Ferrari third, and Honda a poor fourth. <laughs> Down the straight for the last time. The chicane, the only hazard to the checkered flag. So it's a Repco Brabham day with the boys from down under well on top and Denny Halm, the winner of the 29th Grosser Prix von Deutschland. 
It took a top car and a top driver to do it. The top ringmaster of 1967. <laughs> Does he remember what he said before the race? And it would take me at least another two meetings, I think, before I get used to it, unless, of course, I finish this Grand Prix, then by that time I should know a bit more about it. Congratulations, Dennis. Well done, Dennis Holmes. Well done, the Bavins. One and two for the Bavins. And well done, Chris Amon. A fine third place in the new lightweight Ferrari, bringing him up to share third place in the World Championship with Jim Charles. I kept the car going as hard as it would for as long as it would and it survived and I survived and so here we are the winners, went very well.